All right. I know it's
encourages us that we are safe in the hands of the Lord. Um, but our part is mentally, just spiritually, just to trust in Him and hold on to what we know is true from God's Word. Uh, hold to God's mission.
it's going to be worth it all. Amen. 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 And we have that to look forward to. And uh, let's just worship the Lord one day when we all can.
waiting, we're praying, we're anxious. Um, God shows up right on time. He's always right on time. But mercy good for me. with me to Exodus chapter 1. You know, I'm so delighted when one of our church members gives of themselves in such a way to help the whole body. Last week I had a couple of stories about a lawyer, and a lawyer 
in our midst, King of Kings. Lord, how meaningful that was for him. And could I please continue in that same vein? So I thought about it a bit. I said, well, I think I could do it. Well, there was a lost lawyer. He was driving down the road, and he saw, I'm being serious, he, he was lost, and he saw a farmer on the side of the road, so he decided to stop and ask for directions. And he said, where is the main highway to Quincy? And the farmer said, I don't know. The main lawyer said, well, where is the highway to Hannibal? Don't know that either. Well, where does this highway go? Couldn't say. And the lawyer looked at the farmer and said, you don't know much, do you? And the farmer said, no, but I ain't lost. <laughs> you know, we are, we are on a journey through the Bible, and that, my preferred preaching to you is to pick a book and to go through it, that book together, our section, go through it together. We began today studying the book of Exodus, and it's a long book. I don't know that we'll study straight through or if we'll take a break somewhere in the middle and go to another book to study. But from week to week, it may seem that we don't know what we're going, but I assure you, we do. I assure you that, that we are not lost. God has us right where he wants us. Amen. And the beauty is that God's word gives us direction. It, it gives us aid, even in those times when we're in trial. But beyond that, we are taught how to live daily. We are taught how to live our lives in holy fashion that we are more and more Christ-like. Today, again, we begin with our study in the book of Exodus. If you are able, please stand with me. We'll read through the whole chapter together. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his household, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died, and all his brothers, and all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong, so that the land was filled with them. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies to fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied, and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves, and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick, and in all kinds of work in the field. In all their work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shiprah, and the other Puah, when you serve as midwife to the Hebrew women and see them on the first stool, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but let the male children live. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this? And let the male children live. The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Let's pray together. Lord, we are grateful for your word and the opportunity to gather, to worship, to pray together, to listen as you speak to us from your word. Teach us, we pray this day. May we learn from this passage. May we be encouraged. May we be convicted in areas where we need to be convicted. Lord, we do pray for your Holy Spirit's presence and movement in our midst today. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. You may be seated. You know, Exodus continues the story that began in the book of Genesis. We see that connection immediately in these first five verses. In Hebrew, this book is named after its first two words, Wedlock, Shabbat, meaning these are the names of, when you see that here in verse 1, these are the names of the sons of Israel. This same phrase occurs in the book of Genesis, chapter 46, verse 8, where it introduces a list of Israelites or Jewish people who were first coming to Egypt. When was that travel? When was that, that taking place? Well, it took place when there was a drought across the land, when famine did very hard on every part of that area. Joseph was already in Egypt. He had been brought to a position of prominence. And when the famine came, he reached out to his family and brought them to Egypt so they would not starve them, so the nation would continue. Exodus is Latin. It is, it is derived from the Greek word meaning exit or departure. You probably could have guessed that. The book of Exodus teaches us a lot about God. It teaches us about his attributes, about his redemption, about his law, and even how he is to be worshipped. We'll see that as we go along. Today, our message is entitled, Leaning on the Rock. You might even say, Clinging to the Rock. Let's look what our passage has to say. Number one, we do not know what a day may bring forth. There's a story told of a spider walking through a harvest field. And as the spider comes along, it meets up with the grasshopper. The grasshopper puts out his antenna or feeler almost as if to shake hands. And the spider reaches out and touches the grasshopper, but it attaches a strand of web to the grasshopper. And the grasshopper is not worried. I can break free of this. And they continue to talk. Soon the spider again touched the grasshopper, and the grasshopper pulled against it. See, he was stronger than the strains of the web. He still was not worried. Well, time passed, and more and more strands were put on the grasshopper to the point where he did become worried, and he tried to pull away, and he couldn't. The spider turned the green friend upside down and had it for lunch. And I think about this little story, and you see illustrated in the example that, that change does come often, and it is unexpected. There are times when, when we say we're enjoying the norm for today, but that norm that we enjoy today will not be the same norm for tomorrow. Today's joy, today's contentment does not guarantee that those same feelings, that same condition will endure forever. Proverbs 27 1 says it this way, do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring forth. Amen? Amen. And that is the truth. We can proceed in our lives and think we're on top of the world, and we can we can be joyful in that and excited about that, but we do not know what the next day may bring. And so it calls us to have a per the perspective of God, to be aware that all things around us are held by the hand of God. Well, let me give you a little bit more information. I think it's important for us to have. Going back into the book of Genesis, chapter 47, verses 5 through 6, Pharaoh says to Joseph, now, Pharaoh is the leader of the land. Joseph is second in command only to the Pharaoh. And he says this, your father and your brothers have come to you, and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. And if you know any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. So they have come to escape the famine. They come so they won't die. And when they get there, they are received very favorably because Joseph was held in high honor. His family received that same welcome. They were given the best of the land. And they were asked by Pharaoh, do any of them have special abilities? Put them in charge even of my livestock. And they were prosperous in that. Now, time has passed. From the time of Joseph's death to this new Pharaoh, it seems that about 200 years have passed. 
Now, instead of being treated with compassion, I mean the people that are left, now instead of being treated with compassion, they're being treated with disdain. The day has changed. What, what changed? I want you to think about that for a minute. What has changed? Would you say that the Israelites were where God had placed them? Say it. Yes. yes. They were where God had placed them. Would you say that they were doing what God intended them to do? I say yes. They were still before. You might be a little more hesitant to say that. But God was beginning a process. What was that process? What's the name of the book? What does it mean? Exit or departure. So what was God doing? He was getting this work that would move them from a place of oppression and a place of slavery and bondage to what? What did God promise his people? The promised land. And it was before them, but it was taking something to move them. And I think it's interesting as we talk about this, even to think about when Israel finally leaves the land of Egypt. They have a tendency to grumble. They have a tendency to say, why did you take us from this land of, of plenty where we have lots to eat and we're out here and we're, we're eating this manna. We're tired of it. And they long for something. But God had to place something within them. He had to stir within them a desire to leave the place. And sometimes we have to be made uncomfortable to be willing to move. I've talked about this before. We, so we and I had served in, in Virginia 20 years when, and, and we probably in a sense could have retired right where we were. But God had to do something within our hearts to be, for us to be willing to come. He had to give us a sense of unrest or a, or a lack of peace. And sometimes our eyes are really open when, when a change takes place. What took place in this land? They are living prosperously. Joseph has encouraged that. But now Joseph has long since been dead. There's a new guy in charge. He did not, the scripture says it this way, a new king over Egypt came upon in power who did not know Joseph. And so this great change took place. Chuck Swindoll once spoke about his time working in a machine shop. He said there was a place in that machine shop that was so hard, they call it the heat treat department. And they heated that metal to a place where it was, it was almost white because of the heat. And he said what would happen to dross or the slag would rise to the top and it was superheated like that. And a person would go in and it was so hot they would have to wear an asbestos suit to keep from burning themselves. And they would remove that slag from the top of this metal lock. They wanted to take out all the impurities. And Chuck Swindoll talks about that, that truth in our lives. The heat of our trials, when you're going through a trial, the heat of that trial brings the impurity of our lives to the top. Well, who goes in to take it away? It's Jesus. Jesus comes in to, to wipe away till we are clean. Now, what do you listen? I'll say this several times today. Whose hands are we in? We are still in the hands of God. We don't know what a day may bring forth. Number two, we will at times face unfair oppression. We see that in verse 11. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. Verses 13 and 14. So they ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service and mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field. And in all the work, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. So let's look at this oppression for a moment. Slave masters were, were put on the people. They were put into forced labor. They were worked ruthlessly. They were made to feel bitter in their lives. Why did it come? The, the answer for us is in Scripture. Why did this oppression come? One, one is because they become so much, so numerous. They were thriving in the land. And the Egyptians thought this. If we are attacking war, one of our enemies comes against us, 
perhaps this nation living in our midst will take sides with this attacking nation and we will be defeated and they will escape. And that leads us to another point. The Egyptians fear that they will lose their labor force. They had slaves who were very formidable in the work they were doing. And they didn't want to lose that. And so that was why the oppression came. We have to realize there are times when we will get a raw deal. We may, I think sometimes it happens like this. We may be a perceived threat to someone. Have you ever been in a position when the new person comes into the office? They are good. They are talented. And so somebody looking on wants to give them the raw deal because they're jealous. They don't want to lose their position. They don't want to lose their ranking. And so the person coming in has done nothing wrong. They're just doing their job well, and yet they're oppressed because someone perceives them as a threat. The next thing I know, he's going to have my job with my say. And so they oppress him. Sometimes we, we face oppression just because someone has a different plan for us. Again, we can go about our work, whatever it is we're called to, but if that doesn't match up with the other's plan, they may come oppression. Sometimes we are just subject to wrong timing. We're at the wrong place at the wrong time. But I want you to know, we are still in God's hands. Amen. I, I think some of you will remember this. It was 1988, and it was on the news at that time. Now, if you weren't born at that time, you can't remember this, so I'm going to tell you about it. In 1988, in Los Angeles, a woman was driving, it was a young, young lady, 19 years old. She drives off a bridge, but she doesn't fully drive off the bridge. Her car is left daily by one of her back tires. And that was on the news, and so some of you might remember the coverage that was taking place. So she's in this car, rescue teams respond to her aid to try to get her out, but she's trapped in the car, and they're afraid because of the precarious position of the vehicle. Two and a half hours they work at getting her out of the car, but every time they would make a movement, she would cry out, almost as if she was in pain, and they would stop, thinking the car was gonna go over. They finally released her from the car, and she was safe. This is what the fire chief, he was in charge of the whole operation, said. She kept hollering out at us, saying, I'll do it myself. Oh. <laughs> it's not the right thing to cry out, is it? <laughs> and think about the times when we were in a trial. Where do we need to turn our cries? We need to turn our cries to God, who has us in his hands. Cry out to God. We can't do it ourselves. Right. We need the strength of God. We will at times face unfair oppression. Now, today, I'm not able to, I'm not saying this point because I've been jumping ahead. The Israelites cry out because of their oppression. They cry out to God. Number three, I think this is one of the most interesting or more interesting points of this of this section. And the question is, is civil disobedience ever the right thing? And I think that about that in our day, it is a matter that is forefront for us. Is civil disobedience of the right thing? Well, I want to present to you two scenarios. We have one right here. The first one is this. The midwives did not do what the king of Egypt commanded them to do. And the second, well, and they, in fact, they lied to Pharaoh. You catch that as we're reading along? The Israelite women are, are vigorous. When we go to assist them, they've already given birth. And it was a lie. But they were protecting the boys. And for, for me, I always think about this passage. It was the work of Satan. This is Satan trying to destroy really what would become the lineage of Jesus. You get that? That more back. Satan already at work. Well, here's the second scenario. In Joshua chapter 2, Rahab also tells a lie. And if you remember the story, spies had come to the land. Israel was after, was after the Exodus, they're ready to take the promised land. What was his first big battle for? The fortified city of Jericho. And so the spies are sent. They want to see what the defenses are like, what they will need to do to bring victory. But God leads them to a perfect place. He leads them to the house 
of Rahab. And Rahab hides the spies up on the roof underneath, I think with some flax, something she, she hid them under. And so the people, the authorities came looking for these spies. She said, no, they're not here. Perhaps you can catch them leaving town. And when they left, eventually she lowered the spies out and let them escape. What's the common thread? What's the common thread between these two stories? Let me read to you from Joshua chapter 2, two verses, actually three verses. I know that the Lord has given this land to you. This is right now speaking. And this is such a great message. I know that the Lord has, has given this land to you, and that a great fear of you has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because if you think about this message, here's, here are the Israelites ready for this big battle. What did they need to hear? They, didn't, they probably didn't need to hear boo, because they might have run. They needed to hear that the people they were ready to do battle with were fearful. They needed to know that God had already placed that fear into the hearts of those living in Jericho, and they were right for big. I think it's very interesting in comparison. You look at the story of Gideon. Gideon to himself was, was no account. He's just a small figure. And he was afraid as God called him to lead Israel against the Midianites. And remember what happened? There's certain things that happened. We put out the police to know that. But right before victory was given to them, he was still afraid. And God said, go to the king. And so one night, he crept up outside the camp. Just in time, God's time, just in time, he arrived at the camp to hear two of them talking to each other of their great fear of the Israelite army, the God of the Israelites. And that's what's taking place here again. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. By the way, don't forget, God's in the, the, the business of doing miracles among you. This is Rahab speaking. We have heard that the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan, whom you completely destroyed, when we heard of it, our hearts melted. And everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and earth below. So we see that tie in. And then in our passage today, Exodus 1 verse 17, the midwives, however, did what? They feared God. The midwives feared God and do not, did not do what King of Egypt ordered them to do. Here, here's the thread or the tie. Obedience to God and the fear of God should dictate how we respond in difficult situations. And that's it. We, when we are asked to do wrong, what is God's right? And that's when we have to be disobedient. We cannot be disobedient to God. He calls us to right by his word. He calls us to justice. Well, how do we apply that? Is your boss asking you, I, I have the word fudge, you can say cheat, or just do something wrong. Is your boss asking you to do wrong? You need to take a stand and do right. Does the society push us in certain issues to get ahead? To just do it like everybody else does it. Do it like the world does it and get ahead. And that's what we need to put our foot down. And I don't care about being ahead. I care about walking in the strength and obedience of God. Amen. So sometimes disobedience is right, but not disobedience to God. Obedience to God. Number four, let's tie it all together. God is able to see us through oppression and through trial. Look, look at what God does here. In verse 12, we read these words. But the more they were oppressed, read it with me. But the more they were oppressed, the more they what? They multiplied. And the more they spread abroad. They were trying, the Egyptians were trying to put them down, but what was happening? God was raising them up. The more they were oppressed, the more they spread abroad. You know, Pharaoh tried to put these boys to death, but the midwives feared God more than Pharaoh. And the Israelites continued to increase. We see that in verses 17 through 21. They became even more numerous than before. And God wants to bless us as well. Now, I, I, I'd be probably fault not backtracking just a little bit. So these Hebrew 
excuse me, the midwives, the Egyptian midwives, what happened to them? Because they feared God, what happened to them? What does verse 21 say? It said, the Lord gave them fame. I don't know if you can read it. So I don't think, yeah. And because the midwives feared God, he did what? He gave the families. There was a blessing. They were faithful, fearful, which a better word might be reverent. They were reverent of God to do what he wanted. They were obedient to God, and he gave them families. Let's backtrack for just a minute. The story of Rahab. Rahab was fearful of God. She was obedient to God. And here's what happened. The spy said this. She said, will you protect us? And the spy says this. The spy said this. You will be protected if we do what? Remember? Hang the cord out the window. When we come and take the land, you will be protected if you are in your household, you and all your family. And she did that, and her family was protected. Now, Suzanne is just waiting, and I'm going to say it. I know what you think, right? What am I supposed to say about Rahab right now? Lineage. Oh, who she was in the lineage of? Who was she in the lineage of? Jesus. Jesus. And, and you see this blessing. She was fearful. She was obedient. And she was blessed. Amen. I knew what she was thinking before she even thought. <laughs> <laughs> but we would have had a talk. We always have a talk afterwards. She said, why didn't you say that? So I, I did. I did. <laughs> well, there was blessing to these midwives. Of course, the blessing that we talked about with Rahab. God wants us to bless us as well. Sometimes, though, what do we have to do? We've got to go through the trial. Sometimes we have to realize that time may pass before we see that blessing. Sometimes, well, not, not sometimes, we always have to be fearful, reverent, and obedient. And that's what we need to recognize that God is in control. Amen. Everything we face right now, I, I look at Brother John, and John, I just say to you, I know it's tough making choices about what to do with our schools, with our kids. But every one of us in some way is facing some response to COVID. God is in control. Amen. It's said that on the eve of Napoleon's departure to his Russian campaign, pain, he was so arrogant, he was quite confident of what would take place. And he was with a, a lady of nobility bragging about what he would do. And this is what she said to him. She said, sir, man proposes that God disposes. But he was still so arrogant, he said, ma'am, I propose and dispose. A few months later came after his disastrous retreat. He had lost his crown, his army, and his liberty. The power of God was vindicated. Man proposes. God disposes. A sailor in ship a shipwreck was thrown upon a rock, and he was clinging to that rock as the waves beat against him. Finally, the tide went down enough where he could be rescued. And someone looked at the sailor and said, didn't you shake with fear when you were hanging on to the rock? And he said, yes, I did, but the rock did. That's what we finish today. We are in the hands of Jesus, our rock. We may shake, we may tremble, we may struggle, but the rock is unchanging. He is faithful. He is true. We are to live by his word. We are to be encouraged today. And even in oppression, even in trial, we are in the hands of God. Amen. And God's people say, Amen. Amen. Let's stand in prayer. Lord, we are grateful for your word. And we thank you for examples from scripture. What we read today, and even the illustrations that were shared from Old Testament scripture. For you were so faithful to those who were obedient and reverent to your word. Lord, I pray that we would all be convicted by what we've heard. That if there is a decision that we need to come to, that we would come to that decision. Lord, may your spirit move in our hearts right now. Perhaps there is one who has never received the gift of salvation. They know they're not walking with you, but they're ready to make that choice today. Won't you touch their heart right now? Won't you convict them? Won't you draw them to you this day? Lord, for one, it is, it is just not doing and living the way they need to live. Speak to their hearts. I know you offer forgiveness. Call them back home today. That they may commit to you from this day forward. 
to live in your steps and in your direction. Lord, I pray for each one here, whatever decision may be, that you would give courage for them to step out and share that decision. I speak now to one who's never asked Jesus into their heart. God may be tugging at your heart today. That, that's called conviction. You feel that weight on your heart. If you're feeling that weight, won't you pray with me right now? Dear Lord Jesus, I feel the weight of my sin. I feel the weight of being apart from you. But I also know the greatness of your love. So Lord, I, I ask you to take away my sin. I thank you for dying for me. I thank you for the resurrection and the life beyond this life that you promised to me. I accept it, Lord. Come into my heart, and I live from this day forward for you. And if you pray that prayer, won't you step out from where you're standing? Even now, just step out, slip out past those beside you. Come and take Brother Sam's hand and say, Today, I ask Jesus into my heart. Others may need a prayer of encouragement or have some decision to make. Won't you step out? Lord, I pray for your spirit to bring conviction. For us to respond to that in Jesus' name. Amen. I will encourage you as I do each week. If you need prayer and you're not so comfortable being face to face, we have a room set up downstairs where we can sit and talk and pray with you. So if you have decisions, if you have questions, don't be afraid to step up. You come today as God calls you.
We look forward to having you as part of that. Brother John, will you lead us in prayer and dismiss us? Dearly Father, just uh, what an honor and a privilege it is to just be able to come to your house and, and, and worship you and study your word of you. Lord, thank you for, for the freedoms, dear Lord, uh, to be able to do that, dear God. God, Heavenly Father, in this time of, uh, of, of turmoil and confusion and, and, and school starting uh, uh, at, at college and, and, and at the public and, and private level, dear Lord, I pray that you'll be with, uh, be with our teachers, be with our uh, administrators, be with our, our staff, dear Lord. Calm their nerves. Uh, let them know that you are in charge, dear God, and that, that, that you will protect them. Be with our students as they uh, get ready to come. Um, let them know that, uh, that, that we are here for them, that we are going to protect them. Uh, and I just thank you in advance, dear Lord, for uh, giving us the, uh, the insight that we need to do to, to, to accomplish that, dear God. So I thank you for, for this church and, and the prayers, and, and uh, thank you for this community, dear Lord. And, and uh, just continue to be with us, continue to watch over us and protect us, dear Lord. I ask these things in our name. Amen. 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 Amen